Je vous souhaite le, le, le bonjour, euh, donc Alexis Tremblay. Euh, je vous souhaite le bonjour à tous. Et euh, pour, euh, hein, pour notre conférencière, par égard pour elle, euh, je vous inviterai donc à ouvrir vos caméras puisque, pour qu'elle puisse voir à qui elle s'adressera. Euh, je suis vraiment heureux de vous retrouver euh, tous euh, pour cette reprise du colloque des sciences mathématiques du Québec. Euh, alors, on, ce colloque, on espère qu'il repart et puis qu'il se maintienne régulièrement. Maintenant, en anglais, I'm, I'm Luc Vinet. I'm the uh, director of the CRM, as most of you know. And I'm really happy to uh, welcome you all to this uh, online edition of our uh, CRM ISM colloquium. I had asked people to open for the beginning, before the talks really proceeds, uh, your uh, cameras. As we get into the talk, I will ask you then to shut the video and shut you and mute yourselves. So uh, let me say that uh, the colloquium is organized by Henri Darmon and uh, Jean-François Coeur-Joli, who are present uh, with us. We, we saw them. Um, and uh, so we hope the colloquium will now uh, occur uh, with regularity. I will try to host the session and I pledge for your indulgence if there are glitches, we'll get better as we uh, do more. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm confident that this will go well. Paul needs to be admitted. Uh, so uh, if you have questions during the talk, uh, we, we are already at uh, 50 participants. Uh, you might use, even though uh, the speaker does not wish to keep watching the chat if there are questions, but I might you know what, uh, try to monitor that and ind indicate to her what are the questions. Uh, it, so this might be a better way of proceedings and we might, we will of course have a question period at the end, at which time you can come live with your video and uh, the sound to, to ask the question. Okay, so uh, I, I must, I have to say that I'm really grateful to Lai Song Young for having accepted to offer this talk today. And uh, I will ask uh, Jean-Philippe Lessard to uh, introduce her at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Luc. So um, yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today Professor Lai Song Young from uh, Courant. Um, she's an expert in dynamical systems and ergodic theory. Um, she particularly enjoys, at least this is what her website says, uh, she particularly enjoys chaos theory like one of exponents, entropy, fractal dimension, strange attractors, random perturbations, and rates of correlation decay. She's known for introducing the method of Markov returns, which she did in 1998. And she used that to prove exponential correlation delay in Sinai, uh, Sinai billiards and other hyperbolic dynamical systems. In the last 10 years or so, she has become more interested in applications, in, partic in particular in the study of large deterministic and stochastic systems, non-equilibrium dynamics, and theoretical neuroscience. She's received numerous awards. Um, for instance, in 2004, she was elected as a fellow of, of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She was an invited speaker at the ICM, the International Congress of Mathematicians, in 1994. And more recently, in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2018, she was a plenary speaker at the ICM. She was a Sloan Fellow, a Guggenheim Fellow. She presented the Notaire Lecture at the AWM, the Association for Women in Mathematics. And she presented the AWM SIAM Sonia Kovalevsky Lecture. So without any further delay, uh, we are thrilled and very happy to introduce uh, Professor Lei Sanyong, who will speak about observable events and typical trajectories in finite and infinite dimensional dynamical systems. Okay, thank you. And I, I let me try to share a screen now. Okay. And I will now make sure everyone is muted. Okay, I hope you don't mind. And you can shut down your videos if you. Uh... Success. Indeed. 
Am I muted also? No, no. <laughs> okay, so so should I get started? Please do. Okay, so I like to talk about observable events and typical trajectories in finite and infinite dimensional dynamical systems. And I should really be putting the words observable events and typical trajectories in quotation because that's really a matter of interpretation. It has to do with what you care about. So I'm going to say what I have to say, and I'm going to start with finite dimensional systems. So in finite dimensions, let's think of the phase space of the dynamical system as uh, either a manifold or RD, a d-dimensional space. And F is a differentiable map from uh, of M to itself. This uh, funny symbol after M means that you should be thinking of it as transforming the phase space of M rather than taking it from one copy of M to another. So I'm gonna be doing, saying things mostly in, fine, in, in discrete time, but almost everything I say works for continuous time also. It's just the perspective really doesn't make a whole lot of difference in discrete time is easier to say in some sense. Okay. And uh, so for as long as we are in finite dimension, uh, M is going to denote the bank measure on RD or Riemannian measure, if M is a Riemannian manifold, <clears throat> and I'm going to just say Lebesgue to, instead of saying Lebesgue or Riemannian throughout. Okay, so in this setting, it's uh, often as, people often equate observable events with positive Lebesgue measure sets, okay? Because Lebesgue measure, everybody agrees, is important. Okay? So the picture that I have in mind looks something like this. So there's a big open set that gets mapped into itself. And if you keep iterating it forward and taking the intersection, you get a set to which everything is attracted. So I'm gonna call lambda the attractor and you the basin of attraction. And this is roughly the picture that I have in mind. Now, in this quite general setting, there is a picture that's a very nice picture, an ideal picture or one that we all dream would be true, but I didn't say that it is necessarily true, okay? So this picture is like this. Assuming that we agree that Lebesgue measure is important, we can transport Lebesgue measure forward by the, the dynamical system. So Fn, our star of M is the push forward of M. And in, in this very nice picture, the push forward of, of Lebesgue measure would converge to something. And that's something when it's easy to check is necessarily an invariant measure. And it's obviously the most important invariant measure because this is what we see in large time. Okay, so not only does this converge, but if you think of the, uh, the lambda max, the largest Lyapunov exponent, which for those of you who don't know what it is, it's just really the growth rate of the derivative. Okay, so the growth factor, the rate at which the derivative grows, the maximum growth rate, okay? Now, if the derivative doesn't grow, then of course everything shrinks as you push it forward, then mu should be supported sitting on a sink. We'll just push the big forward and it goes on an, uh, either a fixed point or a periodic sink. And if there's stretching, i.e. if the Lyapunov exponent is positive, then I'm going to, that then in this very nice picture, the push forward measure is an SRB measure. And I'm going to have to tell you exactly what that is in a moment. So <clears throat> this is the picture of a finite dimension that would be nice if it's always true that you have something like an attractor, you push forward the bank measure, it converges to something. And that something either sits on a point or a finite number of points and attracts everything, or it's an SRB measure, which I'm now going to talk about. So uh, am I, is, is, am I, the sound is still okay and everything is still okay? Yes, it's, it's going very well. Thank okay, you. okay. So now next thing I'm gonna do is to tell you what an SRB measure is, okay? So in Hamiltonian systems, there is, if taking again, taking the point of view that the bank measure is important, in Hamiltonian system, Liouville measure is obviously the most important uh, measure. But what if the system is dissipative, like there's an attractor, like it's volume, decreasing. When volume is decreasing, there cannot be an invariant density. It's really easy to check that. Okay. So what plays the role of uh, Liouville measure in Hamiltonian systems? There is no good answer to that, and no single answer to that. But in the case where the, for dissipative systems, when there is sustained expansion, 
uh, when the, i.e. when the, the FNOP exponent is positive. Oh, by the way, I should tell you about my uh, color code. When I use green, it means that it's informal. I'm kind of interpreting something. So when you see, when you see that, you should you, you should think that you know this is an kind of an, an interpretation, something uh, to to kind of uh, not to be taken too literally. Okay. So for dissipative systems with positively up and off exponents, and um, an invariant measure, an invariant Borel probability measure, new is called an SRB measure. If well, first of all, it has to have uh, positively up and off exponent almost everywhere. That's almost by definition. <clears throat> and the conditional measures of new on unstable manifolds have densities. So what does this mean? I just said that it's volume decreasing. So the, 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 the map itself cannot have an invariant density. So the next best thing is to have one that doesn't, to, is to have a measure that doesn't really have a density in all directions, but it has a density in the expanding directions. And the way to say it properly is to say that if you condition on unstable manifolds, which is the same as looking at the measure in unstable directions, then it's smooth, then it has a density. That's because it cannot have a density everywhere. So it's like not map not being differentiable, it has partial derivatives, is that kind of a, a thing. Okay. So Sinai Ruel Bowen is what SRB stands for. And this measure was first constructed for uh, XMA attractors. Actually, they discovered this measure for XMA attractors in the 1970s. And later on, uh, the idea of SRB measures minus its existence was extended to general dynamical systems. So in other words, this idea of SRB measure actually works in a kind of completely general setting, except that we don't really know necessarily whether it exists or not. So before telling you much more properties about SRB measures, why don't I just say, why, why should <clears throat> I think that when I push forward the bank measure that it's going to converge to an SRB measure when there is some expansion? Well, if you take a box and you push it forward, if there is expansion, it's gonna stretch, become like the middle picture. And if you push it forward and it stretches some more, it becomes kind of longer and longer and skinnier in some directions and flatter and flatter in some other directions. And the, but if you look at where the bank measure is, it's increasingly aligned with the expanding directions. So when you take limit, uh, hopefully it will converge to something that has conditional densities on unstable manifolds. So that's the idea for thinking that if the, if the system has a sustained expansion at all, when you push forward <coughs> the bank measure, it's gonna tend to an SRP measure. So a little bit more on that. Yes. If I may, uh, I'll be the uh, speaker. So I'm, I'm being asked, what is the blue color uh, coding? What's the code? For <laughs> Just to make it stand out. <laughs> The, 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 the other ones are just to kind of make it stand out a little bit uh, and it's not, not always used correctly, but green definitely has meaning and green means, <laughs> green means that this is informal. You made the asker happy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. So more about SRB measures. Okay. Why are they important? They are important because, well, we have to first get through this definition. A point X in the phase space is called future generic with respect to an invariant measure if its trajectory average is controlled by the time, the, the, the space average of the invariant measure. In other words, it's a, a point is future generic. <clears throat> if you look at its trajectory in large time, it's distributed according to the measure nu. Now here comes the theorem that connects the, the things. So this theorem was proved by Pew and Shu, but it's actually building on work of many others. And it's a very general thing. It says that if mu is an ergodic SRB measure with no zero of the Epinoff exponents, that means no neutral direction. All directions are expanding or contracting. Then the set is set of future generic points has positive Lebesgue measure. So this is how SRB measures are connected to Lebesgue measure. Now what this means, is that mu is observable, even though it's a singular measure. So, so I, because it is an attractor, it, well, it, you, you can have SRB measures too when it's not an attractor, but when there is an attractor, there is no possibility of having an invariant density. So all invariant measures are singular. So in particular, if there's an SRB measure, it's singular. Well, singular 
measure, you might think, okay, so it's not observable because we only see positive with big measure sets. But no, it, you can still see the points that are controlled by this measure, even though the measure itself is singular. So I want to sketch a proof for uh, how this works because the proof is, uh, I, I think it's easier to remember than the fact. So in the picture, I'm showing a bunch of roughly horizontal curves are uh, unstable manifolds and roughly vertical curves are stable manifolds. And the thing to know is that if you are, take two points on the same stable manifold, then asymptotically they get closer and closer to each other as you iterate the, the map, okay? So that means that if the bake almost every point on the unstable manifolds are future generic, okay? They have the right properties, then all the stable manifolds through them would also have the right property. So assuming that the stable manifold is regular enough is something that I'm gonna come back to. Okay, you need, you, the, if, if this foliation is a very bad foliation, this isn't gonna work, but assuming some regularity, something I'm gonna say more about, then you can look at, you can just integrate out. You can look at what happens on the unstable manifolds, integrate out along the stable manifolds and grab the uh, Lebesgue almost every point on the entire manifold. This is how being a singular measure can still control positive Lebesgue measure sets, even though the measure itself is singular. And this is the whole idea of SRP measures. So I'm coming back to the, just, just the same picture that I'm repeating. So I hope now that it makes a little bit more sense that if we uh, we think Lebesgue measure is important, if it's, if when you push forward the bank measure and it's going to converge to some invariant measure, then if there is expansion, it's got to be an SRB. If it's not an, uh, if there's no expansion, then it's sitting on a sink. If this is true, or I should say if this was true, it would be nice. And it is true for axiomatic attractors, for some special kinds of attractors where the expanding and contracting directions are very well controlled. This is how, this is the class of objects for which these measures were invented to begin with. Unfortunately, it's not true in general. When you push forward the big measure, it doesn't necessarily converge. Okay? And when it converges, the, the limit may fracture into lots of bits, zillions of bits, even infinitely many bits. This is actually known to happen. It's not something that we just worry about. And uh, it's, it's a fairly typical picture that happens under certain conditions, known as new houses, infinitely many sinks. So when you push forward the big, bad things can happen. Well, even when it converges and goes to a single place, it need not be the big. It need not be an SRB measure. And this is the canonical example that people show. Is, is a, look, think of the map as the time T map of a flow on a plane or any other dimension. You have a saddle point. The unstable manifold is also a stable manifold, so it comes right back. And so it, when, when you push forward a uh, bank measure, it goes to something that looks like this figure eight, but because it spends infinitely more time near P, it actually is going to be all be sitting at P, which is not an SRP measure. Okay. So bad things happen. And um, in general, it's very hard to prove that this thing is true, even when it is true, because of cancellation problems. The cancellation problems coming because some things are some, see in the axiom A uh, case, the expanding directions are all perfectly aligned. So you keep expanding, but if they're not perfectly aligned, then you sometimes expand, sometimes contract, sometimes expand, sometimes contract. And it's a very delicate cancellation problem that one has to deal with. And um, so for this reason, um, people really suspect that this is the picture that I put up there is true, but even when it's, well, for sure, it's not always true, but people expect that a lot of times it's true, but even when it, whether it is or not, it's just impossible to prove. So that's the, my little bit for finite dimensional deterministic systems. So if maybe adding a little bit of noise might help, and that comes the next idea. So let me now get to random dynamical systems. So I define a random dynamical system as follows. So you take a phase space M, just like a, a, a manifold as before, and a space of self maps of M, for example, fix some, fix some topology like CR maps or C2 maps of M, okay? and put a Borel probability measure on the space of maps that you have chosen. A random dynamical system is a composition of the form 
f omega one compose f omega two. Okay. In other words, you have a bag of maps. You don't have just one map. You have a whole bag of maps. You put a, there's a probability on which one you are likely to draw, and you draw them out one by one randomly, iid, with according to this probability, and you compose them. Now you can do it starting from time zero or time one, or you can start from time minus infinity. So you can, the the sequence can be one uh, one sided. It can be two sided. And then my notation is going to be omega is omega, uh, which is you know the sequence omega n is the sequence of random random maps. So it's compositions of uh, iid chosen random maps. Now you may think that hey, this is a little bit artificial. Why should I be interested in this? And in, an important example is the stochastic flow of different morphisms generated by stochastic differential equations. If you take a pretty general differential, uh, stochastic differential equation, uh, where dwit is the Brownian motion, and I need some regularity in A and B, but no conditions. And I, what I have written down is Str Stratonovich uh, integral. But okay, so then the, the, it's, it's a theorem that was proved in the 80s that for almost every realization of Brownian path omega, there is a one parameter family of different morphisms or flow maps that behave exactly like the flows coming from ordinary differential equations. So it's like for each omega, it's like what you have is a one parameter family of time dependent flows, except that these things are not independent. They, 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 they have statistics and the statistics is defined by the, the invariant measure. Okay. So, um, so, so there is a, um, so, so if, you, if, you, if you fix the time, let's say uh, you look at time one maps, then to the, the dynamics um, uh, defined by a stochastic uh, differential equation is really exactly what I said. It's a random dynamical system. It's IID composition of, uh, it's, it's the composition of IID uh, random maps. So I want to talk about two notions of invariant measures for these random dynamical systems. The first is the stationary measure, which is the average one. So mu is a measure on M, it's, an invariant prob it's a probability measure on M and it's called a stationary measure if you push mu forward using all of those maps and average over all the randomness, then you get mu itself. That's the usual definition of stationary measure. But for, from the, for dynamical systems, there's another viewpoint that's very uh, important and that's the pathwise viewpoint. Okay. So what, what the pathwise viewpoint is, is that you don't look, you don't average over all the sample paths, but instead you look at one sample path at a time. So one sequence of omegas at a time and you condition on the past. If you condition on the past, then you can, you get a collection of measures uh, called sample measures. Okay. So, um, so of course the, if you integrate over all of these sample measures, you get mu back needless to say, and these sample measures are invariant in the sense that if you look at the one at time zero, so it's called a mu uh, omega zero, if you push that forward using the map at time zero, you will get the sample measure one unit of time later, mu sigma of omega, where sigma is a time shift in the Brownian path. I'm just saying things that are completely obvious. They follow uh, immediately from the fact that the mu omegas are mu conditioned on the past. So another thing that's really important to me is that one could get mu omega this way. What you do is that you go backwards in time, n units of time, and then you start to push forward mu. You put mu on your face space, the stationary, the stationary measure mu on the face space, and you push it forward n times. And you, you go farther and farther back and you keep pushing to, the, to, to, to time zero, then what you get is exactly mu omega. And this is really a consequence of martingale convergence. Okay, so why am I telling you all these things? It's because interpretation is that, well, mu omega describes what one sees at time zero, given the history of what has happened in the past, right? That's exactly what it means to be conditioned on the past, right? So what mu omega is really, is not the, so mu in 
in some sense, it's a theoretical description of the process about what can happen. Whereas mu omega is what you see today, given the last 200 years or more of history that has already transpired. And why is that important? Well, if M, uh, actually I got the M wrong, it should really be mu, there's a typo there. So if mu have, is equivalent to Lebesgue, which it often is, if the, uh, if, if the stochastic differential equation has some kind of hypoelectricity, for example, then mu is going to be equivalent to Lebesgue. Okay. If mu is equivalent to Lebesgue, then pushing forward mu is very similar to pushing Lebesgue forward. And so what we are seeing is that if, when we push Lebesgue forward, actually when we push mu forward, uh, like we said we were going to, it automatically converges. It always does. And what they converge to are these sample measures. So we got this first property for free in the random case. I hope that is clear. I do, do. Would, would someone like me to uh, repeat that? Okay. So the thing that we had hoped would be true for deterministic systems is not always true. It's actually automatic as long as the stationary measure mu is, has, uh, is, is equivalent to the bay and we are, we allow ourselves to confuse the two. Okay, so now uh, just a couple remarks because of words that I'm gonna use is that pathwise, this pathwise uh, viewpoint, uh, one could actually treat pathwise dynamical system, random dynamical systems in very much the same way that one treats deterministic systems, notions like uh, the Epinoff exponents, entropy and so on are all defined and they are non-random, meaning they don't depend on the, 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 the sample path. So coming back to this ideal picture for deterministic systems, the limit in the push forward of uh, the bank measure we said would be either a sink or a SRB measure. In other words, it lives on some uh, stacks of unstable manifolds and some lower dimensional sub-manifolds. Well, what about here? Well, here's the answer. If you take a random dynamical system with stationary measure mu, uh, in order for things to be defined, there always has to be some integrability condition for otherwise you cannot talk about the Lyapunov exponents. But suppose I have those. Then if the largest Lyapunov exponent is negative, then indeed the sample measures are supported on a finite set of points. They're called random sinks. This was proved by uh, Yves Lechong in the 1980s. And if mu has a density um, and the, the Lyapunov exponent is positive, then the mu omegas are random SRB measures, they, which have exactly the same properties as SRB measures, except that they change, they are sample path descent dependent. Everything has an omega attached to it. Otherwise they look exactly the same as in the deterministic case. Okay, so when uh, Le Drapi and I proved this in the 1980s, uh, we did not have a direct proof. We deduced this by going to proving some formula that says that entropy has to be equal to the sum of the positive Lyapunov exponents. Uh, I hope that this formula is of some independent interest. But then I started to get back to this problem a little more recently because people started to uh, pick up on this result on the, part, the random SRV measure part. Uh, for example, people that work in climate science, they're starting to ask me you know, about questions about uh, why is this true and so on. And I found it hard to give them a direct answer. And so I started to look at it again, you know, if what I told you at the beginning of the talk was true, it should actually work that way. I can actually prove it directly. And so together with a former student, Alex Blumenthal, who is now in Georgia Tech, okay, um, we proved it. So we gave a very recently, we gave a very direct proof of this uh, fact that if you have the positive Lyapunov exponents and mu has a density uh, with respect to Lebesgue, then when you push it forward, you get SRB. And how does the proof work exactly the way I told you the picture that I drew is exactly how it works. It didn't work in a deterministic case because there, one really has no control whatsoever or of what happens in the basin of attraction for indeterministic maps. But in uh, random dynamical systems, 
mu almost everywhere, we have a fair amount of control. So everything I told you before uh, in the, at the beginning of the talk, this hope for picture is actually true when you add some noise. Maybe I could pause for a question before going on or should I? Are well, there are questions. You could formulate them in the chat or... Uh... Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Or maybe I would... Let me go on. Okay. So mm -hmm. now let me get to... Uh, were, were there questions? Uh, okay. Okay. So um, in... Um, so getting to infinite dimensions. Okay. For infinite dimensional dynamical systems, of course, the problem is that there is no Lebesgue measure. Okay. So um, to motivate the ideas, let me start by thinking about the case of center manifolds, which I will eventually get rid of. Okay. So let me start with this relatively simple setting okay, where I have a Banach space, a mapping, uh, a reference splitting into a center direction and a stable directions. These are closed subspaces. They are not assumed to be invariant. They are just approximately invariant uh, subspaces. And I'm going to assume that there is an absorbing slab. Uh, I, at the moment, I don't care what happens on EC, but everything has to come towards EC. So as opposed to an absorbing ball, I just want it to come closer to the subspace EC. And then I'm going to assume that there are invariant cones. And by this, I mean the, 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 the following. Uh, I, I, I should say that most of the things that I'm saying now in this part is for kind of motivational purposes. I'm, uh, th these things are all known and I'm not claiming any credit for any of it. It's just to, the maybe repackaging a little bit to make it easier to uh, generalize. That's, that's all that I'm doing here for, the, for, for this part. Okay? So what I mean by invariant cones is that uh, the, for vectors that are uh, closer to EC, that have a bigger component of EC than ES, then when you map it forward, then it, it may expand, it may contract, but it cannot contract by an arbitrarily large amount. So there's a lower bound to how much it can contract or a maximum to, uh, to how much it can contract. So there's a cone, which is invariant. And similarly, in the ES direction, it tends to be contracting uh, more strongly. And of course, I, I, I have to define it carefully. You cannot iterate backwards and so on, but I think you guys can make sense of that. So basically in EC, there, it could be expansion, it could be contraction, but not too contracting too strongly. And everything near ES is contracting more strongly than near EC. So these conditions can be checked for uh, simple enough PDEs, such as, uh, um, su such as the uh, reaction diffusion equations and, and damped klein cordon and so on. Okay. So under these conditions, one has the following results. Okay. And I, the first one is the existence of a center manifold, okay. which is the graph of a function from EC to ES. This result has been proved uh, many, many times by many people. Uh, very often under slightly different conditions uh, and, for, and often in the context of differential equations, but it's more or less really the same thing. And I, I have grabbed out the geometric picture, which I'm going to generalize, okay? but it's not a new result. Okay, so there's a center manifold that's roughly in the direction of EC. And there is a stable foliation, not a single stable manifold, but a foliation that is roughly uh, parallel to ES. Okay. So this result is also known. I don't quite know who exactly I should attribute it to, but it's been around for a while. So what, what maybe I should just show the picture then it's easier to see. So, for, so the whole space is foliated by, uh, uh, by, by, by leaves that are graphs from ES to EC, the, 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 the green lines, which are actually, uh, has very high, probably usually infinite dimensional. So, and these, uh, th this foliation is invariant, meaning that the map would carry one leaf to another one and along the leaves is contracting. Now, the third result is the one that I wanted to show you. And that is the absolute continuity of the WS foliation in the case when the center, when the center manifold has finite dimension. So for this third result, let me assume that EC has finite dimension. So what absolute continuity means is this, 
that if you take any two discs that are transversal to the stable foliation, so roughly in the direction of EC, then you can define a holonomy map that goes from sigma one to sigma two by sliding along these WS leaves. Now, keep in mind that EC is now finite dimension. So sigma one and sigma two are finite dimensional manifolds, but the foliation, the transverse foliation, the leaves are all finite co-dimension. So, but nevertheless, you can slide along them and you can define the map. And the absolute continuity and stable foliation says that this map is going to preserve the Lebesgue measure class from sigma one to sigma two. And this result was proved uh, in uh, a few years ago. Okay. So um, I want to interpret these results for you. So the picture looks like this. Okay. So I have a, I have a, a, a mapping of Banach space with uh, reference uh, directions and so on. And so there is a, there's a finite dimensional center manifold and a whole stable foliation that are equivariant, I should say equivariant rather than invariant because they move, the, the map moves one WS leaf to another one. Okay. So what does the existence of a finite dimensional center manifold means? It basically just says that, well, the, even though the dynamics happens in infinite dimension, if you watch it for long enough, it's captured by some uh, low dimensional space. Now, what about the existence of the stable foliation? Well, that means a little bit more. It means that if you take an arbitrary initial condition in the Banach space, there actually is a solution that lives on the center manifold that is going to be asymptotically close to exponentially fast. So every single solution in the, uh, every single initial condition in the Banach space, okay, there is one, there is, there's a corresponding solution in the, in, uh, in the center manifold that is going to track very closely. In fact, the two are going to get approach each other exponentially fast. Well, what about this absolute continuity of stable foliation? Well, the, so, so the second result says that, okay, so every topological structure that you see, the, the topological structures that you see on a, a center manifold reflects all the topological structures that you see in the whole space. But it's only on that level, it's topological because the projection is continuous. But the absolute continuity of the stable foliation says that the Lebesgue measure class on the center manifold is the same on any k-dimensional manifold transversal to WS, where k is at, at bigger than or equal to the dimension of the center manifold. So now we're starting to see something where uh, the big measure classes are, uh, are preserved. Now this means that one can think of this as defining a notion of almost everywhere on the, uh, in, in the Banach space, in the sense that if you can take and take a, a finite dimensional take a fin finite dimensional uh, manifold or a finite uh, parameter family of initial conditions, if you will, for most of them are going to be, if it's the dimension is high enough, then most of them are going to be transversal to WS. What this result says is that Lebesgue almost every in your K parameter family of initial conditions, it's a notion that is well-defined. You can take another K parameter family and it will be the same notion, okay? The, so the notion of almost everywhere really works for any kind of, uh, 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 a manifold that's or, or, or plane that's transversal to the WS foliation. So uh, I am having some problems. I, I am unable to move forward. I'm not really sure why. Uh, should I try to get out and get back in and see if it works? Okay. Maybe. Ah. Okay. Yeah. This is the this is the age old trick is to go out, come back in. <laughs> okay. So uh so let me see if it, yeah, if it continues to work. Okay. So um the um so the idea is that 
in, in a Banach space or in infinite dimensions, if we still want to think about, connect the idea of, of observability uh, to Lebesgue measure, then of course there is no Lebesgue measure to speak of, but one can probe this infinite dimensional space using finite dimensional probes. And this is the idea that I, I am trying to, uh, I have been trying to explain. Now, this is not a new idea. Uh, this idea uh, was in fact introduced a long time ago in the classical theory, uh, uh, functional function theory in a book by Benjamini and Linden Strauss a while back. I think they call the, the they, there's the notion of how, uh, how null or null, how, how null measure or something like that that's in, in this setting. And it was rediscovered um, by Hun, Sauer, and York, and they called it shyness. So what is different here is that uh, here, I'm, it, this is in the context of dynamical systems. It in fact fits very well with invariant manifolds theory. I mean, I don't really have to assume that the foliation is absolutely continuous. It naturally is. The stable foliations are naturally continue, absolutely continuous. Uh, so it, it is a very natural context um, for, for, for this notion to happen. It also says that the probes can be anything. It, well, it tells you that there's a, the, there's a limit to the dimension. There's a lower bound to the dimension. If you take too low dimension, a probe is not going to show up. But anything that's bigger than the dimension of the center manifold, then almost any kind of a manifold that's transversal, and actually any manifold that's transversal to the stable foliation will have this property. So the next thing I'm going to do is that I want to get rid of the center manifolds and go to a more general uh, infinite dimensional dynamical systems. Now, there is no uh, general infinite dimensional dynamical system. They come in many, many flavors. And so to fix ideas, I'm going to look at particular kinds of PDEs, namely the simplest kinds. So let me look at this dynamical setting for uh, PDEs of the form uh, du dt plus au equals f of u, the simplest possible, where u is uh, in the function space x, uh, a is a linear operator, and f is the nonlinear term. Now, to define a CR dynamical system, or at least C1, C2 dynamical system, we need a phase space. So I'm going to say something. Uh, the, what I'm going to say in, on this page is, uh, is, is, is kind of like a funny way than, uh, uh, of looking at PDEs. That's not exactly the normal thing to do for, for those of you that are experts in PDE. Okay. So to define a dynamical system, I need a phase space. So it's going to be X, the function space, uh, in a, with a norm, let's say it's Banach space. Okay. And of course, uh, I need, uh, if I start from uh, an initial condition there, uh, U, of, U is zero, then U of T has to exist and be, uh, be unique. Okay. And the semi-flow, so it's well-defined. Uh, I'm sorry for mixing up the notation. The F sub T has nothing to do with the F on top in the equation. That's just the semi-flow. Okay. So the semi-flow has to be, be well-defined and the solutions exist and unique. Okay. And that's not a problem. And T going to U of T should be continuous. Uh, so that, that's easy. Um, here's the last condition. It is that the, the time T map, in other words, the map that takes U sub zero to u of t, okay. The map, this map for each t bigger than zero has to be smooth. And this is the one that imposes some restriction on the choice of the Banach space. So what, what, what the, the thing that's a little bit different here is that you can't just start with uh, some, uh, uh, you, you can't start with a, a function space and then start the flow and then look at it later on uh, in some other norm. If you're going to iterate a dynamical system, you've got to keep the same norm throughout. Yeah. This, so uh, this is necessary if you want to study uh, if you want to study the semi-flow as a dynamical system. And the reason that it, uh, this time t map of the semi-flow has to be CR is important if you want to uh, take advantage of the differential geometric techniques from finite dimensions. If you don't, then of course that's not necessary. Now this is a little very different from most results um, on the dynamics of PDEs where you show that certain special solutions exist. If you want to prove that 
uh, periodic solution exists. If you want to prove that there is an invariant torus worth of solutions, for those things, you don't need to fix a finite, uh, you don't need to fix a phase space the way I did and to, to in, impose the condition that the time T map be CR. So th th this is uh, something that's a little bit different than usual, but I don't see how you can, one can get around this if you want to uh, leverage uh, the kind of dynamical systems theory that one has in finite dimensions. Uh, so, uh, but the, the, of course, I, I'm not talking about an empty set, hopefully. Um, this is the most general, this is a kind of a, a general result that uh, everybody cites. So I thought I would mention this. Um, so suppose that this, so this is taken from Henry's book, uh, Dan Henry's book in 1980. And so if X is a Banach space and A is a sectorial operator, uh, equivalently it generates an analytic semigroups. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with this, to think of it as a generalization of self-adjoint, so that the spectrum is allowed to get into the uh, get 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 into the complex part of the plane, but that the 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 resolvent set has to contain at least a sector, and there's some control on the on the norm as it goes as it gets away from the real line. But just think of this as like more something more general than self-adjoint. Okay, so here's the fact is that if you start with uh, a, a, an X zero and, and, uh, and, and a, an operator, um, X one is the domain of definition of the, uh, of the operator A, there is always an interpolation space uh, with together, that comes together with a family of norms. Okay? So think of X zero as L2 and think of X one as H2. But, in general, the X has the boundary conditions and everything else built into it. So it's not so easy to say exactly what those things are. Okay. But anyway, here's what the theorem says. Okay. The theorem says that given a PDE of the form where A is sectorial, then you, you use A to determine this uh, family of interpolation spaces, X alpha. Then what determines when you have a CR a semi, uh, when you have a, when the time T map is CR is the nonlinear term. If the nonlinear term F is a mapping from X alpha to X is CR for some alpha, then you can use that X alpha and you have a, uh, you have CR time T maps from X alpha to itself with the alpha norm. Okay, just to show you that this happens all the time. When given any concrete equation, it's not so easy. It's not so hard to write down exactly what you um, what what these things can be. But there are also general results in this direction. And by solution, of course, I mean the mild solution. So, I want to uh, finish by discussing two general results uh, for infinite dimensional dynamical systems. Uh, so the tech assumptions are that I have to start with a Banach space or Hilbert space and a continuous semi-flow. I want to assume that the flow is C2 uh, for T strictly bigger than zero. I can't possibly hope for that more than that. Okay. The second assumption that I'm going to make is that F, both the FT, the time T map and the derivative uh, by which I mean the Fréché derivative of the time T map uh, are uh, injective. Uh, this corresponds to backward uniqueness of the equation. Um, I don't actually know if condition, the second condition is absolutely necessary. I just used it in the proof. Okay. The third one is absolutely necessary is that I need to have a compact set that attracts, so there's an attractor. And the fourth one is not in a condition, but once you have the setting of one, two, and three, there, uh, it automatically follows that there are lots and lots of invariant measures, often too many. Okay, so this is a setting that's very close to finite dimensions. And I want to uh, tell you which results from finite dimensions carry over and how. Okay. So these are the three results, three, three things. The first one is the Apinoff exponents, which described uh, infinitesimal behavior uh, of the derivative map. This carries over, and I'll say a few words about this, you know, what's different with finite dimension and so on. Once you have the infinitesimal behavior, which directions expand, which directions contract, and so on, then there are nonlinear objects that are associated with it, namely the stable and unstable manifolds. 
those carry over. I won't talk about that. And then there's the absolute continuity of the stable foliation, which also carries over. So the Epinoff exponents. So the setting is that F is the time T map of a semi-flow uh, with an attractor. So it's not that far from, this is the infinite dimensional setting that's in some sense closest to finite dimensions. And mu is an invariant measure on the attractor. So now to talk, the Epinoff exponents is about which directions are expanding and contracting. And here's the one thing that makes an infinite, infinite dimensional theory differ, different from finite dimensional theory is that for a single operator, uh, there is the idea of a Kuratowski measure of non-compactness or essential spectral radius. Okay? So I want to see it this way, uh, the two are equivalent, but I want to see it this way. So I have a bounded operator. If I look at the unit ball, I look at the image of the unit ball, for as long as it's a bounded operator, then of course I can cover it with balls if the balls have big enough radius. K, the kappa sub zero of t, the, this Kuratowski measure of non-compactness, is the smallest r that for which uh, the balls of radius, a finite number of balls of radius r can be used to cover the image of the unit ball. So this is case. Why is it that I prefer this definition as opposed to uh, essential spectral radius is because it's very easy to see when you compose different maps that this quantity is uh, sub-multiplicative. So the, in, in ergodic theory is very convenient, the limit exists. And it's well-defined almost everywhere. So here is the uh, theorem proved by many times over. It's a very important theorem. So it was proved many important theorems uh, should be proved <laughs> by many times over each, each time uh, with a slightly different viewpoint. So this theorem has been proved many times and I'm gonna state the ergodic uh, theorem, ergodic version of it. So uh, now if you want to decompose a uh, matrix or an operator into uh, eigendirections with rates of expansion and contraction, of course you can never make it past the essential spectral radius. And the same is true here. So pick a number kappa prime, which is bigger than kappa, where kappa is the growth rate of the uh, Kuratowski measure of non-compactness. Okay, so you, you, you fix it, then um, there, for, there's a finite set of numbers and a finite decomposition of the tension space at each point into uh, invariant subspaces. In each direction, it grows, uh, the growth rate being lambda i being the growth rate in, a, in the subspace E sub i. So it's like a moving frame picture of eigenspaces uh, that's true for, for, for finite as well as infinite dimension. Uh, what is different from infinite dimension is that you can't get below this Kuratowski measure of non compactness So there's an infinite chunk, uh, f of x. Uh, that's an infinite dimensional space. And you cannot really uh, separate things that are further aside from saying that the growth rate is not faster than log kappa prime. Okay. So actually, I'm not sure if I have made any mistakes with logs different places, but you, I think you know what I mean. Okay. So this is the theorem on Lyapunov exponents. That's for finite as well as infinite dimension, except for finite dimension, you don't have this infinite chunk that you cannot uh, resolve. And in infinite dimension, you usually do. So um, in, in order to distinguish between expanding neutral and contracting uh, directions, we have to assume that this log kappa is uh, smaller than zero. Otherwise you would be grouping together a whole bunch of things that may be expanding or contracting. If, if log kappa is smaller than zero, then you can at least set, distinguish between expanding neutral and contracting pieces. So I'm gonna assume that from now, from now on. And so as I mentioned earlier, once you have this uh, infinitesimal theory of the Lyapunov exponents, then there are local stable and unstable manifolds. Um, those things require proofs. They're a little bit different, but not too hard. And the idea of SRB measure also extends to this setting and it's like defined exactly the same way. So I'm not gonna say, repeat that. And so here's the theorem that says that, so let's consider a general F mu as above, meaning it's an infinite dimension with an attractor. Assume that mu is SRB, 
so that, in other words, it has densities on unstable manifold. It has, first of all, it has unstable directions and it has uh, an invariant density on unstable manifolds. That means that the bake almost every point on, on the, uh, un in the un on unstable manifolds, you have a stable manifold defined. So you have a whole WS foliation. Assuming no the Epinoff exponent, this stable foliation is absolutely continuous. So this is a generalization of the result that I showed you a little bit earlier when there's a center manifold. Now there's no longer any assumption of center manifold. The only assumption is that there are enough uh, stable manifolds around uh, and that is guaranteed by mu having a density on unstable manifolds. So for as long as there are enough stable manifolds around, that foliation, which is actually a pretty, it's a measurable foliation. It's not really a foliation. It's not even defined everywhere. It's only defined almost everywhere. But it has the property that whenever it's defined, you can slide things along and it's absolutely continuous. So what is the interpretation of this? Is that the notion of almost everywhere for K parameter families of initial conditions makes perfect sense in the neighborhood of the attractor for as long as K is, has, is uh, has at least uh, is at least as big as the dimension of uh, the number of, uh, of of the unstable manifolds. So k has to be bigger than the dimension of the unstable manifolds. And if there are no serial Epinoff exponents, then uh, the things about the center manifold picture that I showed you continues to work. So let me summarize uh, the what, what, what I uh, have been trying to say. Okay. So first, in finite dimensions one often equates observable events with events that have positive Lebesgue measure. That you may or may not agree with that, but that is a fairly uh, typical thing people do. So building on the first point, if you uh, adopt that viewpoint, then there's a very nice dynamical picture for like, deterministic systems. But unfortunately, that picture is not always true and it's very hard to prove even when it is true. Point number three is that with the addition of a little bit of random noise, it actually doesn't matter how much for as long as you can, you, all you need to do is kind of fuss things up, then everything becomes more tractable. You still have to prove a few things, but it becomes much, much more doable. And the, and the, and the picture, the hopeful picture is true. So that's the picture in finite dimension. In infinite dimension, there's a notion of almost everywhere via finite dimensional probes that allows one to connect with finite dimensional theory. This is what I was talking about in the second half of the talk. And so the program that I'm currently interested in, I thought I would share that with you, basically consists of putting these four points together. Okay. Now, if I go to infinite dimensions, and I do a random forcing in finitely many modes in infinite dimensional systems, okay? If I can connect to finite dimension and because I'm doing random forcing using points numbers one through four, maybe I can produce this hope for dynamical picture as well as the notion of almost every trajectory for infinite dimensional dynamical systems such as the kind of, such as the, the, the semi-flows generally rated by the kind of PDs that I talked about. So this is my main message for the talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I invite uh, all the participants maybe to uh, turn their camera on so, so that the- so maybe, uh, maybe I should stop. Uh, we should yeah, maybe you share, could- share, right? it, Yes. And uh, and I invite you now to react and ask a question. So uh, really, it was much appreciated. Very elegant and and very well delivered talk. So you Thank can you. Uh, you let me see. You can you probably saw that you can raise your hand and uh, and then uh, turn your. So who wants to go first? So Guillaume, Guillaume had a uh, question. All right. Hi, Guillaume. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. How's it going, Lysang? Thank you for the great, great talk. Um, Thanks. I, I wanted to, to revisit something I've always wanted to ask you, and I think this is a good 
good uh, venue here with respect to these uh, omega labeled uh, invariant measures for random mm -hmm. dynamical system. And the question is very much geometric in nature. Uh, and of course we have, you have proven this great results that are, uh, you know, valid for almost every omega uh, that one can think in the space of all the, the, the paths. And my question is, is there any way to think about the dependence of these um, uh, omega labeled SRB measures with respect to uh, perturbations in the omega space? In other words, like if I change the path that I, by a minute amount in some way, can I predict the changes in the, the underlying uh, measures? Um, you see what I'm going with this? I'm, I, I'm wondering like if, if these measures encode something about these paths, right? Like you can think about these omegas as the signal mm -hmm. and then the, where that, that attractor sits with respect to the history of your signal. If I change something in that signal way back when and I can measure it, uh, can I say something with respect to how overlaps of the uh, underlying measures will, will, will occur? Well, um, so, so I, I, the, my instincts are that it, it depends on which uh, random map you are changing. Right. See, see these are these uh, mu omegas, these sample measures are obtained by starting way back when and pushing it forward, right? Mm. So if you change something 2000 years ago, but the, the last 2000 years are exactly the same, chances are that is not going to be too different. Right. Right. But if you change something yesterday, then you, you're getting a complete, quite different things, right? So it's really nothing more than uh, pushing forward something. Uh, so how do you perturb this? How much do you allow yourself right. to perturb, right? But so, there's, no, there's no result in terms of, of continuity with respect to some metric on the space of, of, of sample path and the, the, the shape of the measures that you get, right? Nothing more than, uh, not, nothing in that okay. kind of generality. Okay. If you have a more specific situation, maybe, right? I mean, if you push forward something an infinite number of times, mm. or depending on how you're going to change it. Right, all right, thank you. Anyone else with a question? Dima, you could use the hand, but I, I, I caught you, go ahead. Okay, yeah, but I, uh, hi, Lysan, thank Dima. you very much for the talk. Uh, can you hope to have some sort of Bayesian theory in infinite dimensional for infinite dimensional systems? So if you have lots of invariant measures, then uh, maybe can you look at the support of the measure in phase spacer? And uh, maybe you can detect also the somehow non-generic measures using finite dimensional probes once the dimension of the probe is large enough, something like this. Um. I don't really know the difference between measures and their supports is a tricky thing, right? So no, I, I, I don't know the answer. So, so the first part of your question is about to what degree the finite dimensional theory can carry over. A, a good part of it has been carried over if you first fix the measure. Okay, so, so this is the, the catch, right? If I, if I start with a measure, then I can say many things about it in almost the same way. The, the, the picture is not that different than finite dimension provided that I'm in this setting when that that's, I mean, the setting that I talk about is barely infinite dimensional, right? I mean, I haven't, I, I, even though I have an attractor and so on, and it lives in infinite dimensional space, but there's only a finite number of expanding directions is barely infinite dimensional. So many of the results are, as they stand uh, uh, carry over from finite to infinite dimension. But the things that you talked about, I don't even know how to do that in finite dimension. If I didn't know the invariant measure, you can see you can use probes too in finite dimension, right? And see, yeah. And I don't think people can do that even in finite dimensions. I mean, all that works in the high dimensional, finite dimensional space. Mm -hmm. The thing is that there is no good connection between where the invariant measures live and what the thing looks like. Which is kind of what made this deterministic theory so, such a mess to begin with. I see. <laughs> Thank you. Someone else. Hi, I have a question. 
Hi, Jessica. Hi, it's nice to see you. So you, you're here now? Yeah, I moved to uh, McGill a few years ago, actually. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I haven't seen you for a few years. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much for your talk. It was really wonderful to, to see um, so many uh, familiar ideas from things that I learned <laughs> in my past. I think I haven't seen shyness in maybe over 10 years, but... Um, <laughs> But I did want to ask a question about um, this new research program that you were mentioning, where mm -hmm. using now this notion of shyness and trying to inject randomness into these finite dimensional uh, manifolds. Is there a way in the context of PDEs to interpret what that randomness would translate to physically? Well, uh, I was thinking uh, uh, of uh, forcing a finite number of modes in a PDE. Uh -huh. Let's say you take Navier Stokes equation and or, or some, something else and you force it in a finite number of modes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, if the number of modes that you force is large enough compared to the number of unstable direction, of course, I don't really know that in advance, but suppose I did and I force enough of them, then maybe I would create something that's enough to, for the finite dimensional uh, theory to carry over. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I was what I was alluding to, because I haven't carried that out. <laughs> but somehow it feels like the ingredients are there. You know? uh -huh. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Some more? Yes, I, I have one. I mean, it's basically to follow uh, Jessica's question. So, mm -hmm. um, so with that idea of say inducing, I mean having some external forcing term, mm -hmm. finitely many modes. Yeah, I assume that you mean say Fourier Fourier modes right now. Yes, right? yes, yeah. that that's kind of what I. Had. So, so but, in order to test that idea, do would you have some sort of a of a, of a strategy and say numerically a strategy for for uh, for testing that idea? Yeah. What? Well, so so if so suppose that you actually. Uh, had the picture, of course you didn't, you wouldn't know this in advance, right? But suppose you had a picture of some attractor with say uh, uh, five unstable directions. Okay? Most likely, um, most in most directions that you force, it's going to be transversal to the stable foliation. Of course, I cannot guarantee that, but probably most directions that you force will be transversal to that, right? So if I force 10 modes, probably I would have caught all, all the it would be equivalent to uh, randomly perturbing in the un unstable direction, thereby creating some kind of Lebesgue measure in enough in a high enough dimension for everything to go through. This is kind of uh, what I had in mind because I don't know exactly which ones are to begin with. If you had an uh, if, if if there's a linear operator that kind of dominates the picture, I would certainly go with the directions that are more expanding in, in that linear operator and for, start to force in those directions. But it's just guessing. The, the, the idea being that if you if you take an infinite dimensional space, if you look at a five dimensional object, if you take you know six dimension and randomly do it, you're probably gonna catch it. Or hopefully, hopefully you catch it. Okay, thank you. Can I ask sort of a silly question? Can I uh, suppose, uh, uh, can you have a stochastic system which is uh, almost surely completely integrable? Probably very unlikely, but uh, it's, it's probably something very strange. Maybe it doesn't exist. Yeah, you, you almost have to cook it by hand, right? Yeah, yeah, no, you wouldn't expect such a thing to occur. Right. But, uh, you can, you, know, you can like... cook it. You can, you can start with run and then translate, respecting everything. <laughs> Otherwise, it's probably going to break. Uh, if you do it randomly, it's, I mean, if you add the noise randomly, it's, I mean, it, if if you if you take a dynamical system and say that you're going to add, uh, uh, you you you're going to add uh, uh, um, randomness to it with. Uh, Brownian motion, but not a vector field, just just a straightforward Brownian motion that amounts to random translations, right? Okay, yeah, right. So you can do this kind of things and preserve your integrability. 
<laughs> yeah, no real but, but that's what I meant by cooking. It. But this is like cooking a fugu fish, right? I know that. Yes, yes, yes. You have exactly. to cook it in a very, very special way to right. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, it's probably going to destroy something. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so maybe you know, I, I'd like to don't want to uh, abuse of the time of our speaker, uh, That's nice. <laughs> but if you you know, there's no. We, we are looking for the etiquette of these uh, Zoom, uh, you know, colloquia, right? How, how do we thank you and uh, let you go? But if you want to stay online, those of you, so so Jessica, you have a question? Oh, you want to applaud? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so you're, you're getting a, a virtual... <laughs> I, I get the sentiment, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're, we're very grateful. Thank you so much uh, for, for uh, relaunching our, uh, this, this series. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we will uh, let you go. But if you, you can stay online, we um, might ask the uh, the main host to uh, just let it uh, go. And uh, well, to all the participants, thank you for uh, being with us. I think you you've uh, must have enjoyed the uh, the the afternoon. And uh, we hope to see you soon at this uh, same series. So once thank again, my son, thank you very very much. Thank, thank you, you thank you for having me and best wishes for relaunching this series i'm i'm sure you will do just fine <laughs> thank you thank you very much